The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the We Can 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the We Can Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the We Can Radio Team. Good afternoon and welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, this is your host, Michael McAuliffe, with Perry Haichu, our co host here in the studio with me, and uh, our other co host, Kurt Duhach, is off today. So, um, boy, there's a lot going on. It's, it's amazing. Uh, it, there's a real snowball effect in the entire cannabis regulation and uh, the, the political arenas, and there are still great injustices out there, and so uh, uh, we're, we're going to talk about them. But there's some local news first that we'll talk about and uh, and Perry you were saying you saw this a, a day or two ago from the uh, Department of uh, Public and Behavioral Health I think most patients in the state of Nevada will appreciate this change that the department has made apparently the last day that patients will be able to visit the Department of Motor Vehicles to get their medical marijuana card is Thursday August 11th of this year beginning on Friday August 12th the DMV will no longer process medical marijuana cards in person the new procedure will mail cards directly to patients eliminating the need to apply in person patients with letters of approval who have not yet visited the DMV may visit the DMV before Friday or simply wait for their card to arrive in the mail letters of approval may be used to purchase medicine and dispensaries for six for 60 days from the letter's date of issuance. Now, patients have been complaining about this for years. We have to go to the DMV. People think it's invasive, intrusive. There has been this, this miscommunication among people for a long time that the uh, driver's licenses are, in fact, your medical marijuana mm -hmm. card, and those records are linked. Um, I think this is a negative for me personally because I used to utilize my privileged status as a medical marijuana patient. Uh, well, let me back up. When you went in for your medical marijuana card in the state of Nevada, they would automatically put you in the handicap line due to, I yes. believe, the way the uh, the language was written unintentionally. And uh, I used to take that opportunity to do my registration or mm -hmm. whatever kind of other DMV business I had. And I was in and out of the DMV within half an hour, 45 minutes every single time. This eliminates that... Uh, that convenience for me, but I believe most patients will find oh, it, gee, will find it positive. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, me gaining the system, I know, but still, I, I, it is a good thing for most patients who, or especially the critically ill people who don't have the opportunity or the ability or the financial uh, means to get to the DMV and take the time out of their day or, you know, people who are very busy have full-time jobs. It's a pain in the butt spending a, a, just another day out of your life and jumping through mm -hmm. another hoop to get your card. So I, I agree. It's it's uh, it's another common sense reform that should have happened years and years ago, but we're, we're glad it's out there now. Uh, it just, it's, a, it's amazing how slowly the state, and I don't just mean the state of Nevada, but how slowly uh, government on a federal, state, or local level moves on this. Uh, it, it's as if the they're afraid they're stepping into quicksand uh, when really they're just comporting with the the wishes of most uh, of their of their constituents and as far as this particular story goes uh, yeah it absolutely makes sense not to have to go down to the DMV there the what they do is they use your driver's license picture or your non driver's license ID picture now I guess if you've just recently moved into the state and you don't have a picture on file with the DMV that you're probably still going to have to go down there. Well, yeah, you have to get a driver's license or re-register your car within 30 days, supposedly, of moving mm -hmm. here anyway, so... Yeah, we know everybody listens to that. Right. <laughs> uh, but, but the thing is that uh, once they do have you on record, that's, uh, that's a, you know, a good time-saving step. Now, uh, over the past several years, uh, a number of activists have testified to the legislature and spoken to, uh, uh, to the various politicians saying, if you have a long-term chronic condition, if you have MS, it's not going away. If you have Parkinson's, if you have uh, cachexia, any, uh, glaucoma, any number of things, that these aren't go going away. And so why should you have to go through this whole process every year including you know up till now going to the DMV when when you really the state could make it more like a driver's license and have you renew once every four years so should this be a blanket policy for all medical card holders or should we create a subsection a subclass 
of what terminally ill or critically ill people who would qualify for these for these cards because I guess some people would come back and say well if they're critically ill then they might not be here in a couple of years to renew them anyway so well, why would we grant them this privilege generally um, medical cannabis patients are there for chronic illness long-term illness not the acute injury you know a traumatic injury or something like that that they're going to be over and done with in three months or something like that so uh, most of the patients who get on this program uh, will remain on the program for multiple years and you know you could you could make a case for saying well if if your reason for getting on the program and on your doctor's note and everything says that uh, this is a temporary condition then it should be revisited in a year but uh, in the vast majority of cases, and it's not hard for the legislature to ins insert a few lines uh, in in the in uh, 453A about this, but that if you have a long-term condition, then the state should help you with a long-term solution and and not unduly burden you with having to go to the doctor and refile with the state. And I mean, they they're moving in the right direction with this with the uh, with the DMV and not requiring you to go down uh, every you know every year year but uh, there's a lot more that they can do in this area it seems like these various entities and <laughs> agencies that are tasked with regulating this industry have a lot more power than I anticipated outside of the legislative mm -hmm. uh, language that has been given I was really I thought that we were kind of tied into a lot of this and that we had to wait every two years to change a lot of this but a lot of these regulations that I thought were set in stone have been flexing a lot the California card recommendation by the Attorney General mm -hmm. this change by the Department of Motor Vehicle I'm not sure if it was a DMV or the Department of Behavioral Health and Human Services that made this change but it just seems like a lot of very I'm major sure it's health. It, it, it is the, 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 yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the division I guess we're, yes, we'll call the division uh, is, is setting all the policy on this and you're absolutely right that, that most people think well you put it in the law and that's it well in 2000 we voted uh, the medical cannabis law into the state constitution and you know the state <laughs> legislature did the bare minimum they, that they could the next years year later. and then ignored it for, for another dozen years and so um, it's, it's a case where the legislature puts things out in broad brush strokes they're going to say well you should do this you should do that but they they have the minutiae of all of these um, of these details and regulatory uh, nuance uh, to be enacted by whatever regulatory agency it is in this case uh, health the, the division um, but that's that's not untypical uh, of the way that laws are, craft, are crafted where do those powers and and the legislative authority begins can they technically change whatever they feel like well if you if you look at, at this program and this this division in specific they will say well we're not going to go one step over the line of what the legislature allowed us to do what they put in statute but because it was broad brushstrokes uh, there's a lot of room for them to maneuver and determine well we think this is what they meant we think that's what they meant and even in the face of legislative intent where you you'll have somebody like Senator Siegerblum saying oh well this is what we meant to do uh, the the division is not compelled to follow that right. uh, it's the division technically operates under the executive branch so they're uh, they're operating under the auspices of the governor's office and uh, that's a co-equal branch of government and so uh, they have an awful lot of authority to uh, to make determinations now then the problem arises if they do something and and you or I or, or a, a patient out there says no this isn't right you go to the third branch of government the the judiciary to determine whether the division went too far if it's legal or or okay. not if it's constitutional mm -hmm. and and so uh, that's that's just the way that our entire system has been set up um, and so there's nothing wrong with that per se but we all know uh, who are, who are interest in, interested in, in this topic that um, the regulators uh, in the executive branch are much more conservative, and even the lawmakers are, are much more conservative about this issue than the American people are. No doubt, much more conservative than the public uh, polling would 
would showcase. Absolutely. And so, you know, we're do you gonna... think this is just a common thing of people fear what they don't understand? And a lot of these older lawmakers either were not very well exposed to cannabis or had uh, maybe negative, negative exposure to cannabis through the, you know, like people throwing rocks at the soldiers when they were coming home or like they associate the hippie movement with the with the cannabis movement or liking it to it or like, you know, something to that effect or like, I'm not exactly sure where all this, I don't want to say animosity, but maybe overcautious nature. Well, animosity is, is from. a good word for it actually, because a lot of these people, especially as you say, the older uh, generation of, of politicos uh, have been brought up through 70 years of reefer madness propaganda. Uh, propaganda and so uh, they believe they're educated and they believe that they know the truth on this and unfortunately for them uh, the science does not agree with that and it, it's a case where propaganda is very effective on on so many people you know Mussolini demonstrated this in in Italy in the 1930s Hitler in the 1940s Stalin uh, you know we saw in in our own country throughout the throughout the late 30s and in, into the middle of the uh, 40s in, with World War II uh, we the official portraiture of Japanese soldiers was you know with uh, of of monkey like people with you know thick glasses on and, and, you know, protruding buck teeth. And this was just a, a it, it was not true, but it, it was just <laughs> that the stereotype. picture that was painted, a stereotype. Yeah. And, and uh, cannabis has definitely been victim to uh, multiple uh, stereotypes over the years. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, most of them negative because the people who are doing that stereotyping and putting out that propaganda make money from prohibition right and you've got those people in power making uh, political contributions and and they get themselves appointed to this agency or that representative for a, for an executive and and all of a sudden they're speaking like they're a complete expert on this and um, the odds are none of them ever tried it and you know they they don't need, they they have no idea, uh, and it's unfortunate, but it's uh, it's the system we're working in. So we were talking just before we came on air mm -hmm. about um, uh, about Bernie Sanders uh, not uh, getting the Democratic nomination, uh, and the fact that uh, he's got something like 126 of his followers now running for office, and I think uh, that's where the change comes in and we need to see people here in Nevada running for this part-time legislature that we have uh, and you know not be one-trick ponies not be totally focused on this issue but be sensitive and sensible uh, about this issue because the vast majority of Nevadans support it and and I've all, I've been telling politicians for years it's a political vote getter it's not a it's not a vote repulsor and they just have a hard time it that. is when I was younger and I used to tell people that I you know was a cannabis consumer or that I wanted to get into marijuana consulting or things like that people were really you know uh, hesitant to take my card or you know have any serious conversation but at the, these days, as soon as my card comes out, or they say, oh, I'm a marijuana consultant or activist, oh, man, it's an icebreaker. Everyone wants to talk about it. Oh, my friend or my family member or this or that. Or that. It's always this, uh, it seems like everyone has developed a story recently about how marijuana has influenced their life for the positive rather than, oh, you know, I hate the dopers. I hate the dope and I hate the doper narrative that we used to, uh, we used to get when we put ourselves out there. Of course, in some professional circles, um, we still do get that. I have reason to believe that was denied for a loan because of what was on my answering machine once. I missed a call from a loan officer, mm -hmm. and they didn't give any reason to deny. I, I, it's a long story, but you know, I, I believe there are still negative, uh, negative stereotypes, especially in the financial, the financial world. There that absolutely we have to, that, are. We, that I, we have to break down, and I I'm not exactly sure know how to get that. A, um, an MME license holder here in the state of Nevada, um, who. Uh, somebody just decided they wanted to, you know, get even or get back at them or something like that. And they called up their bank, which was Chase Manhattan, and said, oh, do you know that this person is involved in the medical marijuana business? And uh, without any investigation, Chase Manhattan closed the four banking accounts that this person had with them and, and cut $80,000 line of credit that they had uh, just because um, hearsay th these pe yeah hearsay uh, 
uh, but just because of the fact, really, that uh, this person was involved in a legal business, had gone through all sorts of vetting by the state and the county, uh, and yet, because of the federal government and the prohibition, uh, Chase said, yep, yeah, we're, we're closing yeah. you down. Uh, fortunately, that, that is a, an outlier. I haven't heard of anybody else who's had that happen, but, you know, it, if it happens to you, it's pretty damned inconvenient. It is what it is. We'll try to chew through it. <laughs> you know, you're, you're talking about um, uh, mainstream, uh, going mainstream with this, and we've, I think we've got another story here about runners and athletes. We, in the past few weeks, we've talked more about um, uh, people uh, in football who've been coming out and There's a lot of mostly. athletes who are starting to kind of break the, uh, what do we say, come out of the cannabis closet, mm -hmm. either active or formerly active uh, athletes, you know, both professional in a, I guess we would call a club level and in an Olympic, Olympic level also. I heard, I heard, I read a blurb on the internet the other day that said the World Athletic Doping Association recently has allowed Olympians to consume marijuana for the first time, wow. reversing their policy. They said, as long as you don't consume on the day of, day of competition, we're not going to hammer you for it. And that's a big retraction from them stripping people of gold. You know, I believe there was a Canadian snowboarder who had his gold medal stripped from him back in the late 80s or early 90s because of cannabis use. I mean, people have their, literally their athletic lives ruined by that. And it's, uh, it's nice to see that at least they have taken that stance to understand it's not such a serious infraction. It doesn't harm the, the integrity of the sport to allow people to help them recover after the, after the fact. Mm -hmm. And, and even more recently than that, you have uh, Olympians like Michael Phelps, the swimmer, uh, who lost a number of endorsement deals after a, a photograph of him, uh, you know, hitting on a bong was, was widely circulated. And, you know, I, I just don't understand it because all this swimmer was doing was trying to take that deep hit and, and increase his lung capacity for when he was swimming. Do I mean, you remember, you know? do you believe that this comeback of his has anything to do with his kind of, it's kind of like a personal quest for redemption kind of thing like i don't want to say like there's nothing else for olympic swimmers to do after the olympics but mm -hmm. i don't know where he was supposed to go and the way he went out not like he did go out on top. Deals. yeah that's he, where the money is yeah he wants to come back i mean i believe that since his last that incident with the bong all these states have gone recreationally legal the mm -hmm. tone has softened on marijuana significantly and maybe he's looking to pick some of that back up and try to get back into the public uh not necessarily talking about marijuana but try to reclaim his his uh his prowess among endorse uh, among being an yeah, endorsed athlete yeah, yeah, you know what i mean to, to make yeah. a living from that well you know uh it's not only swimmers and footballers uh but there's a, a piece of uh, in alternate uh dot org by april short and it she's showing that more athletes are coming out publicly and that um that what we have now is a runner's world article from last February detailing the many reasons runners are mixing marijuana and mileage and the subject has been a source of major debate in running circles and you have uh, we've got three runners here um, who and I, I don't follow the sport so I, I don't really know who these people are but it's good when anybody uh, is courageous enough to uh, to come out and tell a story that that might have blowback against them and so one of them Avery Collins lives in Colorado uh, which, of course, was one of the first states to legalize in, in 2012. Uh, and he told uh, Leafly that he used marijuana socially during college but started using it as a professional training tool after moving to Breckenridge, Colorado. His training regimen uh, consists of five-week blocks of really heavy-duty workouts. He says he's, he's running 150 miles a week, uh, you know, and averaging anywhere from 25 to 30 miles a day, and, and 30K to 40 k feet in elevation climbing a week going up and down yeah. the hills and he says he uses cannabis to help his body repair the wear and tear of intense training periods to run a hundred state straight miles he says like the race i'm doing this friday i could be out running for 28 straight hours that just amazes me and he says once you stop you sit down and it's crazy your body has been so used to running for over a day that it still thinks it that it thinks it's still going so your muscles just throb and throb and all of a sudden it all stops and everything swells up with its various medical components you can actually cut down not only on the fatigue but you can calm the muscles and shoot down a lot of that inflammation i was just going to say that the inflammation factor might be something significant in that uh 
in that repair process. That's very interesting. We've had we've interviewed the 420 runner here mm. on this show, and he swore up and down that medical cannabis helps him perform at a higher level. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if it gives people a competitive advantage or whatever, but if it works for you, it works for you. It's as simple as that. I think there's a difference between competitive advantage and recovering and re- repairing and rebuilding your body mm-hmm. after these events. Uh, High Times quoted another runner, Jen Shelton, as saying, the person who is going to win an ultra marathon is someone who can manage their pain, not puke and stay calm. A pot does all three of those things. <laughs> and so, you know, that counter argument can be made that, oh, she's using it and it, it's helping her, giving her advantage that, that others don't have. But if they're not using it before the race, if they're using it afterwards to manage pain, uh, how is that different from using uh, NSAIDs or other anti inflammatories or, or anything else? It technically isn't. Um, that's very, very interesting, though, what Ms. Shelton here is saying about how it might actually, if used properly during. I mean, that seems that just seems crazy to me. You know, I used to be an athlete when I was younger, and I, I would perform better when I was not, uh, not under the influence for sure, just well, because there was a lot of thinking going on. Like I was a soccer player, there was always a lot of, mo- you know what I mean. But there, and and not to disparage it at all, um, but I think there's not as much of that thinking uh, necessary when you're out doing long distance running and and not to belittle it at all I'm sure there's strategy involved but oh, yeah. but really it, it's you know you you've got your body and you are just working it like a, a machine and a third ultra marathoner uh, Jeff Sperber uh, used to vapor use a vaporizer to inhale some cannabis post race according to a runner's world article and he says when you've been running for that long you've got swelling and muscles and aching joints and you're tired you can take an advil which will help the swelling and inflammation but also that's very taxing on your liver um he says i can't do stuff and function as a normal being referring to the side effects of pharmaceutical pain meds opioids uh as a weed smoker i can function and so you know and this is a guy who's undergone two hip surgeries and a hernia surgery and he's already got stage four arthritis in one of his toes and right he's a he's a competitive runner and so um you know obviously cannabis anti-inflammatory properties are scientifically proven and you know so it's just a case where if these people can use this to help reduce their pain and that makes them better athletes that's not an unfair competition. It's not, and a lot of these people, these professional athletes, this is not a hobby for them. This isn't something they do kind of on the side and, oh, you know, this is just what I do on the weekends. Like, this is their whole world. This is what a lot of these people do for a living. They seek endorsements from this. They seek to build their public profile from this. They wanna be somebody. And for cannabis to be a, it just circles back to another argument we always make. It's hard for people to be gainfully employed no matter what Mm-hmm. sort of employment you choose, whether it be in a professional capacity or even in an athletic capacity, if you consume cannabis, that livelihood is potentially threatened. Yeah. I hear it. That is the number one thing that I hear as a cannabis consultant. When I go out into the world, I'm sitting at a bar or something and someone asks me what I'm up to. That's the law they want changed. Yeah. They want to be able to go to work. And uh, we got, we, know, we're going to have to deal with that eventually. We that, that if... You know, if you're a commercial truck driver, if you're an airline pilot, if you're in a number of positions, that no, we don't want these people um, to have consumed either alcohol or cannabis or anything else, you know, before going to work. Of course not. Just like, yeah, exactly. That's the whole thing. Um, when I'm at the airports a lot, you know, there's a, there was an old joke, you know, if you find a bar, you'll find a pilot at it. Mm. You know, and it's just like that's no one really bats an eye at that. I was at a drag strip in Palmer, Alaska a while ago, and there's a nice two story bar restaurant sitting right by the drag strip track. You see a lot of the guys between races and they're having a beer. Does anyone bat an eye? Of course not. Right. But with cannabis, oh, hey, now, you know, you dopers aren't allowed to 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 to, to touch anything. Uh, if you've had any kind of cannabis in your system. And this goes back to the the intoxication, or excuse me, the impairment versus having it in your system mm-hmm. at all argument, or the de facto limit argument that we need to once again address later on. But once again, to, we'll circle back to that another time. But like long story longer, man, I'm just happy to see some of these, uh, some of these people coming out and trying to show some love to the industry and try to kind of hopefully draw some other high profile people out. The more high profile athletes we can draw out, the better argument we can make to the 
who, who makes these policies? Like the major organizations, like Major League Baseball, National Football League, you right. know, uh, NASCAR, people like that. I don't know NASCAR, but... The you know, International the, Olympic, Olympics Committee. Yeah, and, and, people and like such. that. They are the ones who will push the policies to maybe like the state athletic commissions. If the Nevada State Athletic Commission is having hesitation or something and they see these international bodies loosening up on it, you mm -hmm. know, it, it does nothing but good for, their, uh, for everyone, so... Yep. Uh, so I, I think that this is a positive move forward. And, you know, you were mentioning alcohol that, um, you know, over the past few years, people, we, as legalization initiatives have been moving around the country and, and been largely successful, uh, one of the prohibitions prohibitionist lines is that well you know pot's bad for you and and then we of course say well look at alcohol that's really bad for you and they say well yes but we have a tradition of alcohol use in this country and so we can't prohibit alcohol we tried that and it failed but for some reason we think we can prohibit pot and, oh. and you know even though there's a tradition of, of use of, uh, of cannabis that goes back well before the family. Yeah, I'm not even going to get into the tradition because that's not the argument I hear. The argument I hear is, uh, well, we don't want just another intoxicating narcotic on the streets. Why would we go ahead and just legalize another bad thing? Because um, beer and wine, uh, alcohol prohibition uh, uh, or alcohol availability versus cannabis availability, they're like two ends of a long balloon. And if you squeeze one, and uh, if you squeeze one end, you're going to have increases on the other end. So the more you tighten down on pot, the more people are going to use beer and wine or whatever. And if you restrict that prohibition, there will be people using less alcohol, which is undoubtedly um, a harsher substance and, and more dangerous on the body. So the, the people who make these arguments, oh, we don't want a, another substance, and even when they call cannabis a narcotic substance, it is not narcotic in any way. Um, it, it is a less dangerous, uh, much, much safer alternative than alcohol. And it just, these people don't want to see this and in my opinion, because they have a vested financial interest in that course, I this. read a thing from uh, the Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition blog the other day that was talking about how that Kennedy-backed uh, Project Sam has come to all of these Western states. They have about five million bucks to spend between the five Western states that are trying to uh, to legalize cannabis either recreationally or medicinally to go forward. And you know that doesn't seem like a lot between all those states, but that's a lot of money to spend in less than a hundred days now yeah. to the election. Yeah. So you know it's like. Like, uh, we had Mr. Bresny on a couple weeks ago, and it's like he said, we can't take our foot off the gas now. No. You know, you, do, you think you got it one bit far, far, far from it. Got to get out there and make sure that, uh, that you're registered to vote once that's, again. That's one of the worst things when, when you feel that your side has a lock on something. Oh, I don't need to go out and vote because I know we're going to win. You get enough people like that. That's, an athlete, that, that's a classic athlete's mistake. How many times you under, you know, a greatest strength you can give your enemy is if you underestimate them. Yep. And with that, we're going to take a quick break and be right back. Okay. Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing DigiPath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the DigiPath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com. D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. 
or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And welcome back to the Weekend Nevada Cannabis News Hour. This is your host, Mike McAuliffe, along with my co-host, Perry Haichu. And uh, we're, we've just been talking in the break, continuing our previous discussion about the um, the insanity of, uh, of this prohibition and its effects. Now, I, I know that I, I've heard it so many times where uh, prohibitionists will say, oh, well, yes, we, you know, it's good that we put people in jail for pot, but we only put serious people in jail. We, we you know, nobody goes in for mere possession and, uh, you know, really it, it's not it's not set up that way so we don't need to decriminalize absolute anymore. nonsense and we yeah and and we have a, a couple of stories here and and the first one is from Oregon by David Ferguson writing at rawstory.com and federal prosecutors announced that they're dropping charges against a 19 year old Native American teenager who faced a year in prison for possessing a gram of marijuana you know you can't you can't get too much smaller. Man, than mandatory that. sentencing, man, gotta love it. It's insane. You know, the the, <laughs> the uh, Oregon's Willamette Week was the the newspaper that first broke this story and did the investigative reporting on it, which is so important. Without good journalism out there, we would be in we would be in much deeper shit than we are in this country. Uh, but anyway, so they, so they they spearheaded the uh, uh, the investigation onto this and you know an agreement filed in federal court just this past Thursday stipulates that if, if Thomas uh, th this fellow and uh, his name is Devon Devontre Thomas uh, if he obeys the law and holds down a job for 60 days that federal misdemeanor drug possession charges against him will not be prosecuted uh, and the US Attorney's Office confirmed that now the, the thing that I have with with the issue I take with this is one of the things he has to do is hold down a job now as Bernie Sanders was saying throughout the campaign uh, minority youth unemployment is over 50 percent in this country and especially when you look at Native Americans and their economic situation very few of them actually have good opportunities to work at jobs and I, I'm talking about more than just you know sitting in a convenience store or something like that so to make that a condition of his probation is much more uh, a, a higher threshold to pass than it would be for you or I or, or most of our listeners. I'm trying to see whether this kid lives on a reservation type thing or not because I become aware that some of these uh, reservations are not as wealthy as others and that job opportunities mm -hmm. within them are very very the ones that don't have a casino you mean yeah they're yeah. very uh, the job opportunities are let's say restricted especially among the uh, the able-bodied youth um, I'm concerned about the ability of this young man to find gainful employment not only because of the potential marijuana already pre-existing in his system mm -hmm. but due to the economic circumstances surrounding him and his potential tribe depending right. on where he is now he was at a boarding school Salem's Chemawa Indian School, a boarding school that's operated by the Bureau of Indian Education, which so is an arm of the federal, federal government. Right, on federal land. Now, that is a, that's disappointing. Kid just goes to school, ends up catching federal charges. Yes. Once again, we as cannabis consumers and patients need to be very, very aware of where our rights begin and end. If you're a Nevada patient and you go to the, to the Valley of Fire, that is a state park, you'll be good to go there. If you happen to venture to Red Rock Canyon or the Lake Mead National Recreation Area or possibly even the Toyobe National Forest, which encompasses Mount Charleston, those rights go away. If you, if you encounter a law enforcement officer there, they may or may not, depending on what jurisdiction they fall into, if it's a metro officer or a ranger or something, they can Beyond choose, yeah, yeah, they'll choose to or not to enforce that federal law. And you might find yourself before a magistrate before you know it. And, and we had a former weekend board member who a couple of years ago was in this kind of situation in Utah and uh, they were in a uh, they were in a federal park and you know late at night uh, there were eight or nine of them around a campfire and they were passing a joint around and a park ranger spied this uh, former board member uh, passing a joint to someone and came over and uh, he didn't 
arrest him, but he, he wrote him up on federal misdemeanor charges, which is the same thing that's going here. You know, and, and the difference is, we, and, you know, we, we were talking before, the, before going on air a little bit about white privilege and the like, and, and you know, I, I don't know how much I, 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 I don't want to get into that, but our, our friend who was on the board was a white guy, and uh, they, they gave him a ticket, and he had to pay a fine, and that's all it was going to be. Whereas this young Native American boy was facing a year in jail, and they weren't joking about it. And so, you know, I've been arrested, be detained, and imprisoned of- three different times for simple marijuana possession. It has nothing to do with race, it has to do with the individual arresting officer. How did, the, how did their interactions with said person affect how they came into contact with you that day? Did they get laid that night? Where yeah. did they grow up? Et cetera. Yeah. There are all kinds of things that play into that. Um, are there certain sentencing guidelines that disproportionately affect people of, uh, people of different color? Well, you know, as we like to say, the numbers don't lie. And it's really about as simple as that. <laughs> yes, but but um, whites and blacks and Latinos and Asians in this country uh, use illicit substances at all at roughly about the same rate. But if you look at who's prosecuted, who's incarcerated, uh, there are huge discrepancies. There are there are something on the order of, of ten times as nine times as many uh, African Americans imprisoned for drug crimes as white Americans. And so you know there there is you know. There, there are issues going on there. And that jumps right into our, our next story. I'm mm-hmm. going to jump to a, uh, to a little stat here near the middle of the, the story that I found fairly compelling. <sighs> yeah, go ahead. The USSC... Which is the United States Sentencing Commission. Thank you. Found that, most, that career offenders who account for 11% of the federal prison population are sentenced to long terms of incarceration, receiving an average sentence of more than 12 years, which is 147 months. Most career offenders, 74% in fiscal year 2014, are serving time for drug trafficking. 74% mm-hmm. are serving time for drug trafficking. Now, they didn't... And drug trafficking doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're hauling a thousand pounds on the backs of, uh, uh, what did Steve King say, Mexicans with uh, with uh, calves the size of cantaloupes. No, it, do- <laughs> it doesn't mean that you've... Trafficking is supposed to mean, depending on the substance, over 100 pounds, over 1,000 pounds, um, but, you know, they use it as a, a loose catch-all for that. But, you know, when you look at, at some of the differences between um, cannabis uh, terms versus others it's just staggering and we had this here uh some oh oh, over here um and this fellow that we're talking about in this story is a guy named paul fields and and not for anything he does happen to be white and uh he was he the first time he was sentenced for a marijuana offense uh, he got probation the second time he got 100 days in jail now the third time he got more than 15 years in prison and you might say well why would this guy be doing this and and that and every everything but uh this guy is a, a typical hippie deadhead sort of person he did have a lot of grass for sure uh <laughs> he did but you know um yeah, he did. Okay, but two hundred and fifty-six uh, plants. But you know, it's not hard to get there. If you have, if you have a couple of cloning trays with with clones that you're trying to get rooted, that can no, be they did right not there. specific that they no, were they, they two hundred mature plants right. or anything like that. Right. Um, I, I understand. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're the guys from Tennessee. Yeah, that fairly conservative state. Even yeah. though before Colorado and uh, Washington legalized, I heard a statistic that Tennessee was the second. The state that grew the second most cannabis in the country, right behind California. Yeah. Now I'm sure that's not true anymore. They probably fall into tenth or eleventh, but still, they have quite the cannabis culture out uh, out in that state. So, uh, so I hear. But what we're finding out this this uh, in this article, um, it says that he ended up with a 188 month sentence for Good growing God. marijuana, and that sentence is substantially longer than the average federal sentence for sexual abuse, which is 134 months in fiscal year 2015, robbery on a federal level, 78 months, arson, 62 months, manslaughter, 54 months. Yeah, absolutely true. Uh, my grandfather was assaulted a year ago this week by a gentleman who, uh, gentleman, a scumbag, mm. who uh, 
makes his business to assault elderly people. He had recently been released on char from charges of assaulting another elderly person before he was caught up in this. He's a career criminal. He's a violent criminal. And he was given uh, two to six on a plea deal. This guy assaulting 90-year-old World War II vet veterans is looked upon more favorably in our society than growing cannabis. Uh, it's Doing amazing. it over and over and victimizing the people who are really those in need of the greatest protection. And the thing is, there, there was no allegation in the story that he had sold any of it. Uh, you know, was he generous when he went to the Dead concerts? Yeah, he was. <laughs> but, you know, that's generosity. And, and it, it, it's irrelevant whether he sold it or not, even though, as I said, he, there was no indication that he did sell it. It's irrelevant to the fact that this guy is doing something nonviolent that is, that is not affecting the community at large and gets a sentence that is, on average, three times longer than the situation you're describing, people who are going out and preying on the elderly or otherwise disabled. No victim, and, uh, no crime, right? Yeah. Well, that's, that's what we would hope. But uh, the United States position is that we are all the victim when somebody smokes a joint or, or plants a seed. Is that so? Well, then why does the federal government distribute 300 marijuana joints to what five or six pre-existing patients? There are patients? four of them left alive four in the, alive? In the uh, in new Florida? investigational drug uh, program uh, that started off uh, in the Carter administration and then was eventually uh, sealed off in the in the the George uh, George H W yeah yeah. Uh, yeah yeah Papa Bush or Poppy Bush uh, they stopped uh, taking applications to new patients but there are still four of them alive and you're right they get. 300 grams a month from the federal government. And not only that, you know, for free, free, free yeah, of charge. For free. Not only that, but the federal government has patented three uh, cannabinoids as um, uh, as neuroprotectants. So, you know, so they, should the attorney generals of these various states be suing the federal government for endangering the citizenry of their states by promoting this dangerous drug on their streets and allowing them to consume it recreationally in plain view? I'm not going to hold my breath they, on that. I mean, what are they, how, how, how can they allow this injustice to go on? What, 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 what kind of society do we live in if we can have it on one hand and not the other? Um, Where does that rule of law take place then? Uh, you got me. Uh, you've just got nonsense. You've just got so many people who have so much invested in prohibition that it's it's you know taking the weight of a majority of, of people getting out there and voting and being active and, and to to overcome this inertia and this this um, this protectionism of the prohibitionist industry. It's it's difficult, but. We are coming around. Look at this. And the very last sentence in the article is, is the most telling to me. Arrested in 2009, Mr. Fields went to prison in 2010. Now in his early 50s, he has served six and a half years and has not seen his seven-year-old daughter outside of a prison visitor's room since she was a baby. The only way that this child has had any interaction with her parent is through the looking glass, mm -hmm. seeing him in, a, in, a, in a, a prisoner's outfit because of this policy. Unbel unbelievable. You know, it's not just you know, the victims are the people. The victims are the families. The victims are the families, without a doubt. Without a doubt. With that, we're going to take another break and be right back. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. Attention medical marijuana patients. Did you know that your medicine could contain pesticides, heavy metals, and even mold? Are you really sure that you're getting the same potency every single time? Well, the answer to that question is simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a state-approved laboratory run by scientists. So look for the Digipath Labs quality seal on your next medicine and on the door of your favorite dispensary. To learn more, go to digipathlabs.com. That's D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Hi, 
I'm Armin Yemenijin, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. This is your host, Mike McAuliffe, with my co-host, Perry Haichu, in studio. And we're just uh, discussing various issues of interest um, and, and interest, issues of outrage for, for people who are uh, in this community and, and are looking to see justice done. Um, you know, Congress in the First Amendment, or the First Amendment of the Constitution said, Congress shall make no law restricting blah, 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 the freedom of religion and, and shall not establish a religion. And uh, in its very first treaty with the Barbary pirates, um, the United States said, we are not a Christian nation, we are a secular nation. And, you know, over the past 20, 30 years, though, you have the uh, conservative Christian movement saying, oh, no, no, this is a Christian country and making all sorts of litmus tests for that. Um, you know, but mm -mm. It, it's whether it is or whether it's not, if, if you know, e Episcopalians shouldn't be going to war with Methodists or Pentecostals or or well, I'll leave their religious bickering to the whatever. religious. Yeah. Uh, you know, but but when you have people challenging it on a different level it's amazing the kickback there is from the government now in this case uh, Rhode Island State Police uh, arrested a couple of people a uh, 46 year old Alan Gordon and uh, 56 year old M Armstrong uh, and we get this from the Daily Beast by the way Abby Haglage uh, and so they they've arrested these two people uh, and when they did a search of the of their premises uh, they uncovered 12 pounds of cannabis 10 pounds of hash oil and 57 marijuana plants Wow 10 pounds, 10 of, hash pounds oil. of hash oil that's a lot of hash oil. Oh my! Um, nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, 57 plants. One, as we were discussing in the earlier our, uh, segment, uh, about 250 some plants. Uh, 57 is not necessarily that large of a garden, and so you know. But the police, of course, described it as a large marijuana cultivation operation. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Um, right, here you we know. go. Charged with intent to manufacture and deliver. Yep, possession, <laughs> possession with intent. Uh, standard charge and something like this. And then they were shuffled off to jail and held there for two weeks. Now, you know, now they're prepping to uh, represent themselves uh, on a potentially historic <laughs> case. Yeah, on a potentially historic case, representing themselves. Yeah, you're right. Bad idea. Uh, and they're going to argue uh, that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act protects their freedom to grow and use cannabis. And, you know, they'll have to convince a judge that the Controlled Substances Act places an undue burden on their religious freedom. And, you know, I, I agree with them there, but I, I, I think it's going to be tough to convince oh, a judge. Oh, sure. I believe that the Founding Fathers had that legislative intent, intent very clear, like you said, not only in our original founding documents, but in the various treaties we've signed and the policies we've enacted over the years. Even Thomas Jefferson himself wrote an amended Bible that took, or an amended New Testament yes. that, that took out basically all the miracles and all the, uh, the magic nonsense and the you know things like that mm -hmm. and just basically left the teachings and he and it was like the abridged gospel of Jesus Christ or something yep. like that yep. even him cuz a lot of people like to liken the founding fathers to the 12 apostles they were like one and the same you know yeah. what i mean these guys were all these pious saint-like people and that's just really not true they were independent they were free thinkers and they often argued very mm -hmm. violently about where the direction of this country was supposed to go. I mean, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were good friends who became bitter enemies. And had a, a feud that lasted decades. Absolutely. Over things of this nature, not directly of this nature, we're talking about cannabis, but religious freedom. Where should we draw that line? Why, mm -hmm. Are we a Christian nation or not? And even some of our wisest founders were aware that religion should be respected, but not 
influential in our policy not making. an integral part of the government yeah. absolutely and in this case you know this Ann Armstrong who uh, describes herself as a hippie with a cause she's <laughs> determined to win and she says my religion is cannabis uh, they, I've been accused of that and I, I don't I don't exactly buy that though you know it, it, cannabis can be a component of her religion I think but um, she says they're they're not carding uh, people coming up to get wine if they're if they're not 21 she's talking about in the church when you go up to receive communion so they're saying that kids the, are, the well, states the state or, or the government is not uh putting a prohibition on kids under 21 getting that's different because it's jesus it's it's jesus blood yes i know uh and so why on earth she says would they interfere with our adult c communion of god when it's proven to be safe and her statement makes the central argument of their case and says that the main belief of the healing church that cannabis is the giver of life and they they claim that the recipe outlined in Exodus 30 23 for the off-sided holy anointing oil uh, contains cannabis and I've done some research on this over the years and it comes from from the ancient Hebrew word of cannabosum which are, are alternate depending on who you talk to the ancient Talmudic scholars say that um, that yeah it, it was cannabis uh, other people who are on the prohibition side no so they say it's a sweet cane reed that grew in the area there are 30 different interpretations of the Bible New American Standard New International Version yeah. King James Version uh, you know I could go on and on and on and different churches read from different things and when you change these wording around even though it says in Revelation if you change this word I will strike you down mm. they choose to do it anyway and you know well, they haven't struck down yeah, well, you know, that's because it's, it's all BS. But, but, but <laughs> what, what these people, they're claiming that cannabis is uh, the tree of life is referred to in, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament and, then, and in the New as well. And as St. John prophesied, the tree of life would one day grow in cities with glass streets and glowing multicolored gems. And uh, they write that this sounds surprisingly like an ancient mystic's frantic attempt to describe his vision of a future greenhouse supplemented by LED grow lights. <laughs> Era before glass windows existed, uh, you know, and, and <laughs> a, sure, you know, I'll go with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the the thing is that uh, they're they've decided to challenge the uh, the legality of this, and and they're building on a, a case from last year who that is still in the courts uh, in from Indiana, the first church of cannabis, where its founder Bill Lever, uh, Levin uh, said that his cannabis use is based on the RFRA, and that there is a, a that there's a version of it in 21 states and uh, the law itself dates back to 93 uh, but what's happening is when that law was brought into into being it was because of um, uh, Native Americans who were using peyote. I remember hearing about rights. this. And and the argument that the government the prohibitionists are making is that yes but this was hundreds of thousands of Native Americans who've been using this for centuries then and it's central to their religion so that they need to, to have this and you know that because in these individual churches you just got a couple of handfuls of people that it should not be accorded the same weight of law well no, the Mormons had to fight a war in order to get basically you know what I mean their freedom I yeah. mean, people act like they're this passive group, but if you look at their history, they've been very warlike. Mm -hmm. They had to fight all the way out here just to find their own religious freedom yeah. from our religiously tolerant government because people didn't like what they had to say. I mean, I'm not suggesting that marijuana users should go up in arms and form our own promised land or something, mm -hmm. but I am saying that if you think they're just gonna, that the powers that be will respect your rights just because you think they're your rights, you got another thing coming. You're gonna have to fight for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish I wish these people the best. I really do. I'll be interested to see how it comes out. But a hippie with a cause defending herself in a federal court. That I mean, I don't sound promising. No, definitely not. You know, but the point the point here, is, I, I think, is, is that should be made is that they're saying that it's OK because, you know, Native Americans were using it by hundreds of thousands once and again, this handful of people. Right. Well, yeah, once again, tradition. But I would point out then that. Jesus started out with 12 apostles and you know since then uh, the Catholic and, and Protestant churches have grown to over a billion people well and they were also mercilessly slaughtered and tortured and persecuted for 
God knows how long until they were able to find their own. It's because the Romans weren't smoking enough pot and didn't get mellow. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> you know. No so doubt. anyway, uh, this is something that's that's interesting that that we will follow. Um, the first person to challenge this was uh, Roger Christie out in Ohio, uh, at, at, in Hawaii. Pardon me. Uh, uh, at at the opening days of this century, and and he got slammed by the federal government, and he tried to use this defense, and they didn't want to hear it, and so he's still sitting in jail someplace um, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna see where this goes anyway uh, that's that's a, about all the time that we have um, we are moving forward with our patients first meeting our, our uh, which takes place at the source dispensary dispensary on rainbow and Sahara that's gonna this be Saturday, Saturday at, at 2 o'clock yes. uh, you go on to the weekend Facebook page or our website and take a look we have pool parties coming up we have uh, any number of events and we are going to be gearing up uh, with politicians for this election season and and as we try to say every show, it's really important. Get out there and get registered. And, because if you're not a registered voter, the politicians uh, really don't care about you. It's like they say, the reason why change doesn't happen is because you're not registered to vote and you won't make the change. you got to do what you, you can. Go. All right, there well, you know, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us again. And we hope to see you again next week. And uh, this is for Weekend. This is Mike McAuliffe from Perry Heights. you signing off. Stay safe.